plan and uh, hello to all of our uh, Facebook Live followers and welcome back, Lane. <laughs> okay, so today we've had 7,462 new cases, so the numbers are coming down and that's 2,849 positive rats. Uh, tragically, we have to report uh, three people have lost their lives uh, today. Um, and the Chief Health Officer will give uh, some more details. And once again, um, we express our condolences to the families. Uh, it's heartening to think, though, that the, the numbers initially are coming down, so fingers, fingers crossed. Uh, we've also got um, uh, the Chief Health Officer will go through the numbers in the hospitals as well. We've done 15,586 tests in the last 24 hours, and in terms of vaccine coverage, 91.98% uh, have had at least uh, one dose, so that's good. Nearly 92% of Queenslanders have had their first dose, and we're at 89.53% uh, fully vaccinated. 1.4 million Queenslanders have received their boosters. That's 55.17% of the eligible population. And of our 5 to 11-year-olds, we're at 33.37%. Uh, and once again, can I please urge parents to think about booking their children in um, to get vaccinated? Um, look, I'm happy to advise my whole family has been vaccinated. My parents, my sisters, um, my nieces, my nephew. Um, honestly, and I know there's, there's you know, millions of families out there that have done exactly the same thing. But if you are unvaccinated, um, you run the risk of ending up in hospital and becoming extremely sick. And you all would have heard from Minister Grace Grace the other day. She said, this is a virus you don't want to get. So please, please think about if you are not vaccinated to come forward and get vaccinated. So I'll hand over to the Chief Health Officer and then uh, to the Health Minister, and then we'll do other matters. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Premier. Uh, sadly, we have three deaths to report today, one person in their 60s, one in their 80s, and one in their 90s. Uh, of these three, two had had uh, two doses of vaccine and one had in fact had three doses of vaccine. Um, I probably wouldn't read too much into a single day of, of reduced data. I think we need to look more for a trend in terms of uh, what is happening with deaths. But our thoughts, are, our thoughts are very much with their families. In terms of um, the health system, uh, we have 744 people in hospital being treated for COVID-19. Uh, that includes 46 patients in hospital in intensive care. That's not much of a change from yesterday, but I think I previously mentioned Sundays tend to be slow discharge days in hospitals, so it's not often on a Monday we don't see a great reduction in, in patient numbers. But what I would say is that over the last seven days, uh, say last Monday, the 24th of January, there were 878 patients in public hospitals in Queensland, and that's fallen to 744 today, which is a 15 per cent uh, decrease. Most of that reduction has been in a relatively small number of areas. That's the Gold Coast, Logan, Ipswich and Cairns. Uh, we're expecting that the numbers will start to turn uh, in the rest of South East Queensland and elsewhere in, elsewhere in Queensland in the next seven days. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to the, the Minister. Uh, thank you. And my condolence also to the families of the three individuals who have passed away the last 24 hours and remind people of the importance of getting vaccinated. Uh, we are seeing a slowing down of our 5 to 11-year-olds. We really want families to take the opportunity of this next week, uh, before school goes back, uh, to go to one of the many, many vaccination centres or pharmacies or GPs uh, that can provide not just vaccinations for 5 to 11-year-olds, but also our 12 to 15-year-olds. Our 12 to 15-year-olds, we're still sitting at 67.29 per cent double dose. So it is a quite a low number, and these teenagers will all be going back to high school next week. Uh, and we would love to see that vaccination uh, number come up. And of course, with the 5 to 11-year-olds, we've had 33.37 per cent now. We've got about 65 schools that are now participating uh, in our VAC schools for the next seven days. So have a look at our website. You'll be able to find those sites that are open during the week and also this coming weekend. We want as many people to come forward and get vaccinated. And I also want to um, just give another shout out to our First Nations people, especially in our more remote communities in the far north, 
uh, to come forward and get vaccinated. It is not too late to do so and to start their journey of vaccinations. And if you're eligible for your booster and all those young people who went and got vaccinated in October and November, uh, just as our mandatory vaccination was coming in for our pubs and clubs and hotels and all of those, uh, I remind those uh, teenagers that they will be coming up to their three month mark for their boosters shortly. Uh, to have a look at their immunisation uh, re record on their phone to see when it was and if it was three months ago, you can come forward and get your booster. And really positive news that we are seeing even a further decline in the number of staff that are isolating and quarantining. So and yesterday I said we had over 3,400, we're now down to 3,049. So that's a positive sign, but we've got a way to go. So please everyone keep following the rules, wearing your mask, social distancing, good hygiene, uh, and of course come out and get vaccinated. Do you uh, look, as the Chief Health Officer has said, you know, the, the children themselves are, are not likely to get seriously unwell, but they are likely to transmit it. That's why we brought in the mandatory vaccination for our teachers and for our school staff for this very reason. We know the difference the vaccinations make and having our school staff, including our teachers vaccinated, will make all the difference in reducing that transmission. And as these numbers come up of the number of kids who have been vaccinated as well, will help reduce that transmission. Dr Gerard mentioned the drop in hospitalisation in the last week, that we've had complaints from people who are having to go into private hospitals for key surgeries for breast cancer and having their surgery delayed. How much longer might we rely on those public health facilities, private? Look, I don't think any of us can give a definitive time frame on that. We are it's a you know day by day, week by week proposition. We are not through the wave as far as across the state. You know, we're still seeing some higher numbers uh, in the north. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're through that wave before we look at pulling back any of those beds that we've secured in the private hospital sector. And as we said, we have suspended elective surgery until the start of March. Uh, and yeah, I said we'd review that at the end of January. Uh, there will be no change to that suspension at this time. Uh, so we will sus still suspend that elective surgery until the start of March. Um, yes, so the public health unit will work with each individual school where there is an outbreak. So again, it'll depend on whether that child was um, unwell at the school and the public health unit will still do the normal um, contact tracing to define well, who needs to go into quarantine as a close contact. So it won't be an absolute. It's not that every school would close down or whole classrooms need to quarantine. They'll look at the individual circumstances around who is infected um, and yeah, whether how many people might need to quarantine or at least get tested before they return to the workplace or to the school. Yes, so as, as the Premier said yesterday and the Education Minister, so we will give priority at our um, testing clinics for uh, any family who they might wake up in the morning and the child's come out and said, I don't feel very well. Uh, don't take them to school. They can take them straight to one of our testing clinics and either line up for a PCR or they will get priority if uh, to to take a rapid antigen test home if the parent's comfortable in giving that test at home to their young child. So they'll be able to get access to those as a priority. We will also have supplies at every single school uh, and, um, and where the child becomes unwell or a teacher or a staff member becomes unwell during the day, they can access those ones at the school. What we don't want is anyone who's already feeling unwell at home to come to the school, whether it's a teacher, uh, another staff member or a child to come to the school to get one of those rapid antigen tests if they're already unwell. We don't want them stepping foot on school grounds. Uh, they can go to one of our testing clinics and pick up one of those or maybe arrange for someone else to pick one up from the school. I'm happy to get you that number. I know there's a number who have resigned uh, because they don't wish to be vaccinated, and there's some who have been given show calls and terminated. So I'm happy to give you those numbers. Um, so what we have done as a statewide uh, 
decision is to suspend category three and some category two surgeries across the state. Now, individual hospitals and HHSs are also from time to time having to suspend some other surgeries, whether it's category two or one, based on different circumstances, such as the patients rung up and said, I'm positive or I'm quarantining as a close contact or the surgeon themselves may have ended up being sick that day and needing to reschedule those surgeries. And some of those we've moved to other hospitals as well. So all of those things are happening, but as far as the statewide uh, protocol we've put in place, it's category three and some category two that are suspended uh, until the, the end of February. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Gerard, and thanks, Yvette. All right, as you know, our Cabinet met uh, a short time ago. Uh, this is our second Cabinet meeting for the year. The first Cabinet meeting was dedicated to making sure that our hospitals were prepared um, as we we're preparing for the peak of the Omicron wave. I said that our next priority, of course, was to examine the report that the Parliamentary Crime and Corruption Committee. Uh, delivered last month. Uh, I can report that today uh, Cabinet carefully considered this report at length. Uh, the government's response to the report uh, is being tabled in Parliament and the government supports all of the report's recommendations except one of the reports is addressed uh, to the Commission. Now, in this state, we have a number of checks and balances on power. The Crime and Corruption Commission is central to those checks and balances. Anyone with any complaint about anyone in a position of power can go to the Triple C and have those complaints heard and investigated. This was Tony Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald's legacy after his inquiry. The Triple C has enormous power. The check on its power is the Parliamentary Crime and Corruption Committee. This committee is made up of representatives of both parties and it is chaired by a non-government member. Last year, it examined complaints relating to the Triple C and its investigations into the Logan City Council. And as I said, these are very serious um, allegations and the report was given very serious consideration by Cabinet. The PCCC was the right body to investigate the complaint made about the C, and now we come to the difficult decision. Having decided that for the first time in its 30-year history, the C itself is in need of investigation, who should carry out that investigation? How can we ensure its independence? How can we ensure that following the Commission of Inquiry, the people of Queensland can have absolute confidence in this very important body and its role that it plays, uh, basically being a caretaker of our democracy? Um, I am pleased uh, to announce today that uh, Cabinet has given careful consideration as to who the public would have confidence in, and not only that, uh, the terms of reference uh, that is needed to go with this uh, particular um, issue that is being addressed uh, by the report. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that uh, there will be a uh, commission of inquiry uh, as recommended by the PCCC report and it will be uh, chaired by Tony Fitzgerald. Who better to oversee an inquiry into aspects of the C than the man who created it? Mr Fitzgerald, ACQC, will conduct this inquiry along with retired Supreme Court Judge Alan Wilson, QC. Uh, he will be a commissioner for their inquiry. The inquiry will take six months. The terms of reference mirror recommendation six of the PCCC report, which is, and I quote, a review of the C structure in regards to its invest investigation and charging functions, the role of seconded police officers at the C as a commissioner of inquiry or similar to be headed by a senior counsel of sufficient standing to consider the structural basis of the C that has its roots in the Fitzgerald inquiry. And everyone can see very clearly that um, our tabled response shows that it is supported and uh, the terms of reference um, uh, will be uh, distributed later. Uh, so as you can see, this is um, something that we have given careful consideration to. Uh, we believe in the checks and balances that are put in place as part of our democracy. I've been speaking about this at length over the past few days. I said to the people of Queensland that Cabinet would give serious consideration to this issue and to this report before Parliament resumed. Uh, it was number one on our agenda today. I firmly believe that the people of this state can have absolute confidence 
that Tony Fitzgerald and Alan Wilson will carry out uh, their responsibilities and duties as outlined in the terms of reference um, that um, they have um, uh, been involved and consulted on about. Uh, Cabinet has had a lengthy discussion today and uh, now we need uh, the next chapter to be written uh, to ensure that the public um, and the people of this state, that people of this state have absolute confidence uh, in the Triple C. So I'll hand over to the Attorney General and then we're happy to take some questions. Thank you, Premier. Um, and today, of course, I welcome the Premier's announcement to establish a commission of inquiry uh, to implement the PCCC's recommendations to be headed by Tony Fitzgerald. Ensuring that Queenslanders have confidence in the C is paramount. We want Queenslanders to know that we have an effective, independent and impartial integrity body that is responsible for investigating major crime and corruption in Queensland. And it is a priority of our government to ensure that Queenslanders have confidence in the C. The Commission of Inquiry will implement uh, Recommendation 6, as the Premier has said, but also Recommendation 3 of the PCCC's report. It will relate to the adequacy and appropriateness of the structure of the C in relation to seconded police officers, the adequacy and appropriateness of legislation, policy and practice relating to the charging and prosecutorial powers of the C and also the appropriateness uh, and adequacy of section 49 of the Triple C Act that deals with complaints by the Commission and reports and obtaining advice from the DPP. You will see from the government's response that we accept all of the recommendations of the PCCC. It is a bipartisan oversight committee. They have made strong recommendations in their report they made a number of findings. Um, we take this incredibly seriously and we have a very strong response. As the Premier said, Queenslanders can have absolute confidence in Tony Fitzgerald, the architect of our integrity and accountability mechanisms, now reviewing the C in relation to the findings and recommendations of the C report. Uh, we're happy to take some questions. When will this start? I think um, it starts on Monday, my understanding. Yep. What was Fitzgerald's reaction when you approached? Let me make it very clear. I have not personally spoken with him. I don't think it's appropriate for um, any elected official to be speaking to him as he's going to carry out this um, um, report, this inquiry. Uh, so my department and the Attorney General's department have been uh, liaising with him. This um, has been. Um, over the last uh, month or so. It has not just happened overnight. So government has been taking this report very seriously and we've been canvassing options. We've also, during this time, I've also sought advice from the Crown Solicitor and the Solicitor General about uh, the government setting up this Commission of Inquiry. So we have fully consulted, got the right advice and we've provided all of that advice to Cabinet today. The, the opposition has been calling for a Uh, the terms of reference have been set in consultation with Tony Fitzgerald and they come out of the report, the PCCC report, and they are very specific. Why aren't you extending the inquiry to complaints from other integrity Because we have other robust agencies in this state. I went through those at length yesterday, Lydia. You were there at the press conference and the public can have confidence that we respect uh, the different institutions that provide the checks and balances over government. Let me also make it very clear that the federal government does not have these checks and balances. The integrity commissioner's functions was um, examined at length by Kevin Newbury. The report was handled down to the Economics and Governance Committee. Submissions to that committee are closed today. That committee will be reporting to Parliament 
and then government will be providing its response to that report. I have been through this at length. Of what, what Tony, Tony Fitzgerald recommends from this, absolutely. Absolutely. People need, the people of Queensland should have absolute confidence about Tony Fitzgerald conducting this uh, commission of inquiry uh, with uh, retired judge Alan Wilson uh, QC and the government will absolutely implement whatever recommendations. I'm not going to preempt pre -empt that. It's a six-month inquiry. It has been set up now as a response to the PCCC report. But can I you a point? Can I point? You said that um, you urge public servants to come forward and report any Well, they can have they can have absolute um, uh, trust in the system because the checks and balances are there. But let me be very clear, and I draw your attention to what recommendation uh, six is. It is actually in regards to the investigatory and charging functions and the role of seconda police officers at the commission as a commission of inquiry or similar to be led by a senior counsel of sufficient standing to consider the structural basis of the commission that has its roots in the Fitzgerald inquiry. The government response is very clearly to examine the report on issues relating to the structure of the Triple C in relation to the use of seconda police officers, legislation, guidelines, practices and processes relating to the charging and prosecution of criminal offences for serious crime and corruption in the context of Triple C investigations generally and the operation of Section 49 of the Triple C Act. In relation to what in particular? The Nicholas Stefano um, revelations that have come out, Mike Summerall's allegations about interference, those integrity issues from the last week. Well, what I've said very clearly is the Integrity Commission's office, it's a five year statutory review that is happening, and you are very well aware of this, has been forwarded to the Economics and Governance Committee. She's also back in inquiry into other things, so as has Mike Summerall. So she contributed to the report. She contributed to the, the report to the triple to the um, economics and governance committee. Mike, uh, Mike Summerall's written yep. a new article today suggesting a, a culture of fear ultimately with senior public servants. He says if you're a good boy or girl, you get Well, to I addressed this yesterday and I said I absolutely encourage our public servants to come forward if they have any issue whatsoever. And once again I say to you, I contrast. Now, today is a is a pretty historic day as well. Today is the 31st of January, and seven years ago, the people of this state said no to Campbell Newman. Said no to Campbell Newman, and David Crystal Fully was part of that government. They sat around, let me be very clear, they didn't care about public servants, they sacked them. Go and speak to any public servant that was sacked during that time, and the fear and the culture that existed over that three years. Now, we came in, and we absolutely uh, restored those frontline services that were savagely cut. We've actually put money into education. We've put money into health. We have been uh, leading the world uh, during those two years of that pandemic in terms of a world-class health response to the managing of a pandemic. Just a mic sum all those. Is there any truth to what he's saying, do you think? I encourage anyone who has any issues to come forward, but his matters were dealt with by the Triple C at the time. But, but these are not criminal matters. He's talking more ethical problems within reporting and a culture of fear within the well, department. Well, I reject it. I said that yesterday very clearly. If anyone has any issues whatsoever, I encourage our public servants to, to come forward and, and, and give frank advice to government. I expect nothing less. Neil Dawley is another former media advisor of the government who's come out and, and also says there's a cultural problem. Is he wrong? Uh, well, I haven't heard him say that, but uh, my understanding is that his, his issues have been dealt with. Has the damage already been done in terms of the Triple C's reputation, do you think? I think but people should have confidence in the Triple C. The Triple C is a standing royal commission. But what we found is that there were some uh, systemic uh, cultural issues and issues that related particularly to the dealing of the Logan City Council and the investigation functions of the Triple C into the Logan City Council. The PCCC committee made a number of recommendations and today government has accepted those recommendations. But government is acting quickly. We are setting up this inquiry and we have, and, and we have appointed 
who I believe to be probably one of the, the, um, or the pe one of the per people I revere the most in terms of um, how Tony Fitzgerald brought about change uh, in this state. And the recommendations are being implemented, the terms of reference have been decided, and now it's up to them to get on with the job. Well, I, I don't support that, Lydia. I think people have the right to come forward and, and raise any issues that they have. I, I, can't, I can't say anything more than that. Just like they do in your news organisations, I'm quite sure if there's cultural issues there, they can raise it with their management. So you don't think there's an overarching cultural problem within your government? No, I don't. No. On that, there are concerns that three to five year contracts for senior public servants are a problem because people are scared to stand up to senior management. Do you think there needs to be more permanent workforce? Oh, I think you'll see that we're actually moving towards that. Like we are looking uh, in terms of temporary appointments, we are trying to uh, give permanency to public servants. So I, I don't understand. I don't understand that that particular point you're raising. Yeah, I'll let the Attorney General uh, address that, but um, let me just say uh, we always have a very robust system of that. If uh, people do need, due to their workload, if they do need extra resources, um, government does give very give, gives due consideration to that. Um, thank you, Premier. Look, I am aware of some of those reports. What I would say on average over the last few years as um, funding for the Director of Public Prosecutions has increased um, by 6 per cent every year, but we work very closely with the Director of Public Prosecutions on the resources they need. But obviously there may be findings in the Commission of Inquiry about uh, the investigative and charging powers of the Triple C, so of course we'll implement those. And can I just say on these calls from the opposition for an integrity review, I find it really surprising actually that David Chrysofoli has just suddenly taken an interest in integrity measures because he was a cabinet minister, as the Premier said, in the Newman government. They sacked the Parliamentary Oversight Committee. They sacked 26 staff from the Triple C. And since they've been in opposition, they have voted against our integrity measures around donation bans from developers, donation caps and real-time disclosures. So for the opposition to now be calling on us to implement further measures, I think the best thing that David Christopher fully can do around integrity is to pick up the phone to Scott Morrison because they've promised an ICAC now for years and there is no federal corruption body. We're here today to strengthen our Triple C. With Tony Fitzgerald, Queenslanders can have absolute confidence that he will get this right and that we will implement those reforms to strengthen our corruption body when federally there is still no body at all. Well, that is a specific issue that Tony Fitzgerald and Alan Wilson QC will consider in the terms of reference for the Commission of Inquiry. So, recommendation six of the PCCC report specifically says we need to review the charging and prosecutorial powers and how they obtain advice from the DPP, and that's what the Commission of Inquiry will look at. Just on the mechanics of this, the Premier said it starts Monday, but what, what actually starts Monday? Is <laughs> not hearings and things like that? But no. So, so um, Tony Fitzgerald and Alan Wilson will be on board from Monday. We'll be recruiting staff to head up the Secretariat. So work will get underway from Monday, and they'll report back in August. They have a six-month time frame. Uh, look, um, uh, the, the government has set aside $5 million. Um, it may not come to that amount, but uh, we want to make sure that they are adequately resourced to do a thorough job. When do you expect hearings would actually begin? Uh, you'd have to, they'll probably give you an update once they get the secretariat set up. Uh, when is the terms of reference on the spoke going to be released? Uh, later this afternoon. Okay. Was there any discussion in the cabinet around, uh, around her and the uh, Look, I said yesterday that it would be great. We'll talk to Ash about what she wants. Um, I'm just so proud of her. Uh, everyone in cabinet is, and I don't think there was a cabinet minister that didn't watch the match. Okay. I'd be surprised if there was. Thank you. Thank you.